In February of 2020, I decided to watch Review Starlight entirely on a whim, looking for a new show to captivate my attention after the inevitable sadness of finishing Symphogear's final season. Although I greatly enjoyed the show, there was a distinct reaction to its content that resonated with me more so than what I actually watched. Upon watching the film, henceforth referred to as Geki Joban, I often joked that it was the episode final to the TV show's Kamen Rider Ryuki. Two near-identical stories, but with incredibly divergent narrative progressions that ultimately lead to the creation of entirely separate works. Public the reaction to Review Starlight has been… interesting, to say the least. A good portion of the audience absolutely adored the show for its themes and nuanced delivery of its core Aesops, but there were also a fair few detractors who cited their struggle to understand the show's subtle cues and narrative building as one of the series' major weaknesses. But why is this the case? Why has this franchise garnered a reputation as another Marmite of contemporary anime? And is there more to this show than simply theatre kids with communication issues? That is a question I hopefully wish to answer in this video. But first, there is a question that I believe must be addressed in order to better understand the context of this film. According to Wikipedia, Baroque is a style of Renaissance-inspired art that flourished during the early mid-18th century. It used contrast, movement, exuberant detail, deep colour, grandeur, and surprise to achieve a sense of awe and large scale, with Baroque theatre particularly benefiting from the newfound developments of machinery and larger venues in order to convey a greater sense of theatrical representation. Of important note is Baroque Spanish theatre. Playwrights like Lope de Vega broke the Aristotelian unities of the Italian school of poetry, action, time, and place, while also formulating the basis for a multi-artistic style of acting that drew much closer to the format of Greek storytelling and its desire to understand the effects of contemporary morals towards the modern day. Cool, you might be thinking. But what does this have to do with the Review Starlight movie? There is no such thing as a coincidence. To the uninformed, or perhaps uninitiated viewer, the title of Wild Screen Baroque might seem like a very pretentious, foul art title, designed with the intention of fooling the audience into many of the same assumptions about the TV series to their understanding of the film. In some respects, this is to be expected, and even enforced during the opening act. The movie starts out from where the show ended, but this ending is very different from what the audience is familiar with, down to the exact time frame in which events played out. One factor remains constant throughout. Karen and Hikari are still fighting, and a winner to this conflict is subsequently determined. However, the consequences of the outcome have warped themselves into a distinctly different entity, entirely removed from the ambiguous finale that the audience is, by now, intimately familiar with. The Baroque, in this sense, is multifaceted. While the format of these new review acts is ultimately the same, containing much of the same stakes as before, its format has evolved, no longer satisfied with the individual narrative that motivated the series' conflicts. The technology has transformed the outside world, with the train, Stadium, and Tokyo Tower, among others, serving as a modern grounding for the inevitably firm twisting of traditional choreography. With this in mind, the comparison to Kamen Rider Ryuki episode final is apt. Both works seek to tackle a core philosophical theme of moral goodwill within the context of their societies, but when compared to their televised companions, the matter being tackled is both expanded upon and compressed into the purest possible form of visual storytelling to create the impression of split ends. Many of the shared themes are thinned out to maintain a cohesion with the pre-existing story, but the intent in doing Doing this is not to dumb down the cast's development. Rather, this is a form of continuity that further lends itself to the in Medeus rest nature of theatrical sequels, which contributes to the disjointed style of wild screen baroque. A common theme in the first half of Geki Joban is the purpose of the train towards the story's direction. The train will go to the next station without fail. This line serves as a crucial starting point for understanding the meaning of wild screen baroque, as without it, much of the film serves little purpose other than fanciful eye candy. The train already juxtaposes the conventional venue of review acts, being set in an arena technologically far beyond the range of Seisho Academy's theatre. It's a highly mobile setting that allows for considerable artistic expression in a cinematic setting, but also highly restricts the cast's field of movement in a physical sense, confining everyone to the carriages that couple and detach from each other almost seemingly at will. Baroque thus takes on a new meaning in this scene. On the one hand, it denotes the changing format towards a freeform area that follows the cast around, looming over them as if stuck in a personal hell that they cannot escape from. Alternatively, the Baroque is a sign of the separating storylines. Though the characters, setting, motivations, and underlying critique of theatre is kept consistent, this work goes to great lengths to establish that it is ultimately a different timeline, with a different outcome, and as a result, the ending will also be different. The next station is the ending of Geki Joban, but the stage and its players will disembark, returning to their positions as characters when their role in the film has been completed.
The mise-en-scene, or arrangement, of Geki Joban also plays a key role in understanding the meaning of Wild Screen Baroque and its implications towards the film's narrative. Many elements of how the story is framed to the audience adds to the sense of intrusion that they would therefore feel watching the film unfurl, borrowing elements from the TV show and the compilation film Rondo 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 to produce an unnerving viewing space for everyone involved. Geki Joban is presented in a letterboxed anamorphic format, much like Rondo, establishing itself as a cinematographic piece first and foremost. Though the obvious intention behind this idea is to showcase the scenic atmosphere of the film, giving the widest possible perspectives to each review's surroundings at any given moment, it also enhances the feeling of Baroque as a shift away from the pre-established narrative of review Starlight. The continuity has now moved away from its destination, the metaphorical train diverted to another station, but ultimately ends at the same stop. This letterboxing format lends itself well to the scope of the themes explored throughout, as the cast begins to plan the next stage of their life and expose themselves to the wilderness of adulthood, while also coming to terms with their own personal demons left unresolved at the end of their last encounters. Like many anime tie-in films, the plot starts in Medeus Res, with the ending of the TV series having continued onwards, or perhaps having branched away, from where it last left off. Hikari is revealed as the victor of the final review, leaving an awestruck Karen in disbelief as the two once again split apart and move on with their lives. Much of the film afterwards is set between the modern day in Karen's childhood memories, using a variety of camera techniques to further convey this sense of wide perspective. Wide shots are often used in the film to create the illusion of depth around the cast, which places their distinct personalities at the forefront of scenes set in Seisho Academy, while many of the establishing scenes rely on bust shots or close-up views of a character to signify their focus to whatever particular role the story wants them to play. The film's opening act leading up to the review of Annihilation plays loose and fast with the established rules of theatrical expression, instead playing around with a cinematographic style closely in the vein of Alfred Hitchcock. The letterboxing forms a sense of distance between the cast, as the noticeable tension between everyone in the 99th class is amplified further by the feeling that something is missing from view. Geki Joban attempts to leave events up to a viewer's interpretation, but also attempts to confuse and obfuscate what the true version of events really is. Some of the methods employed to create this impression have been mentioned previously, but the mise-en-scene further amplifies this disconnect between the audience and the film. While the viewers are told at various points that these events events are what we asked for. The definition of who we are is as undefined and superfluous as the purpose of the auditions are at face value. Perhaps the meaning of wild screen here is twofold. It not only refers to how the characters, scenes, and stories are seen through this tighter viewing angle to show the wider world in the context of the 99th, but also how the film takes a more animalistic turn in depicting everyone's tribulations on the big screen. We as the audience are the observers, reveling in the thrill of tragic comedy before us, while as actors, the cast of Review Starlight are the gladiators, forced to replay their darkest secrets in an intrusive manner against their will. The train again plays a very important role in establishing this view. In modern films, the train often serves as an avenue into the fictional soul, creating an occasion for voyeurism and paranoia that allows for insight as to a character's personal feelings through the means of possible downtime between one poignant scene and the next. Satoshi Kon's perfect blue and Manelium actress used the train as a contrast between the false self and the ideal, reflecting how far a character, usually the protagonist, has discarded their own morality in favour of their ambitions, a motif perhaps originating from Yoshinori Kobayashi's nationalist work prior to the new Minelium. The empty seats, save for the 99th class, help to cement each member's goals after graduation, but also highlight how, as the primary characters, they are the focus of this film. Rather than the episodic formula of the TV show, where they inevitably play an auxiliary position to the main event, they are positioned as equals to Karen and Hikari in the overall narrative. The scrolling shots during the train journey enforce this purpose by giving everyone equal representation, but Karen is the one who plays a greater role in the end. As a result, she is glossed over by the beginning of the review of Annihilation, because she exists contrary to the progression of this new story that is soon pushed to the forefront. Using the train is a deliberate choice on the part of director Tomohiro Furukawa. In an interview, he states, Trains are often a metaphor for life in literature. It's the same for this movie, as his reasoning for their inclusion. In his words, they were all intentionally put there as a motif for getting to the next stage of life, or the story after review Starlight. This this is a purposeful choice, done to ingrain a sense of purpose into the menial tasks we undergo in our lives, as it gives the film a sense of meaning through its impression on the audience. Even if things don't go your way, maybe this train will be the one taking you to the next stage, much like the cast of the film experiences throughout. Within the context of Revue Starlight as a critique on the state of contemporary art, Wildscreen Baroque is an opener on the dismal effects of modern commercialism. Theatre is once again regressing towards the position of a high-class entertainment, while animation and production have become hyper-competitive, to the point of corporate embezzlement, corruption, and overwork. Nano's musing that such a stage is nature's providence, isn't it, takes a much darker undertone. Assuming
assuming one considers that she is addressing the desire for visually intricate and intellectually challenging art that pushes the limits of what it means to be human. However, Wild Screen Baroque can also be seen strictly in the context of the animated continuity. The TV show and Rondo are near identical, the latter meant to be a recap of the former's events, but there are distinct differences that suggest, if not implicitly confirming, that the cinematic timeline is actually its own being. The ending presented at the start of Geki Joban is expanded upon enough to suggest an alternative tale, with the rest of the film creating an entirely new perspective on what the original intention of said ending really was. For much of the prologue leading to the review of Annihilation, the existing story is treated as its own complete chronicle, with everyone, save for Karen, moving on with their lives and seeking some extra closure. The use of a train as the setting for this first review somewhat supports this theory, as this sense of voyeurism and consumerist aggression raise its head as the primary motivation for this act. Carl Ruko is the one noting the shift to a new story, reminding everyone of the brilliance that they lost in the previous school year. Although she is the one who wishes for more auditions the most, and is very eager to prove herself again for the sake of her raison d'etre, she is still a minor player on the grand stage, quickly tranced by Nana in spectacular fashion. For her, Revue Starlight is escapism, a way for her to avoid responsibility for her own shortcomings when faced with the eventual succession to the family name. A war of the mind, but still a conflict nonetheless. This adds to the metaphorical sensation of the arena, being nearly entirely contained within an overground tunnel. Everyone involved wishes for a light at the end to give them greater meaning, but that chance never arrives. Additionally, the use of the train serves as further bridging between Rondo and Geki Joban through Nana, who is the central character of the former film. Being responsible for the infinite repetition of the 99th Starlight, she is the only one fully aware of the series' events, with this sudden addendum to her story being an element she is both blindsided by and dissatisfied with. The carriage of the stage features reminds the audience that the focus has always truly been on her, sweeping through the others with avid annoyance, and the camera shots constantly track her every move as she dictates the flow of battle. She is the director, and for all intents and purposes, the rules are hers to command. The second half of the scene makes this omnipotence explicit, as another train lines up to arm her with a katana. The timeline of Revue Starlight and Rondo henceforth diverges, but the changes in the latter meet on a single point, where Nana regains control as the writer of this story. Although she further develops as a tragic heroine, undergoing another loss marking the start of her downfall, it can be argued that she never truly loses her fights, merely giving up the agency that gives her such power. This ephemeral mise-en-scene puts Nana at odds with her classmates, as she exists in a limbo long removed from the context of the story she wrote. Although Karen has become a closest confidant, being placed in the background of many scenes centred on the present day, the distance between them is too great for either character to fully understand one another. Nearly all of the camera angles in their last exchange are either full body or bust shots from Karen's perspective, slowly distancing Nana from the narrative until she eventually relinquishes control of her own work to the audience. There is some subtle meaning in having Nana as the object of interest during her final appearances, as her story now ends, becoming the piece necessary for the conflict to move Jenna's character forwards, Karen thus takes her place as the outsider that exists outside the cycle of starlight, to write an ending that would satisfy everyone. However, Nana gives her power up to ensure this result, transforming her own motivation for an appropriate ending into a primal desire to appease the people who engaged with her eternally unfinished work. She loses herself to the wild screen Baroque, just as Kaoruko, Mahiru, and Maya did, therefore becoming the literary monster, the prototype opposite to the political animal who exists contrary to everything else besides her. In that sense, the feeling of a strong alcohol that Nana alludes to at the end of the review of Annihilation isn't mere conjecture. She relishes that feeling of dictation, that power in controlling one's destiny, being able to manifest that sensation once more and vainly wrestle back some sense of control, perhaps refers to a continued detachment from that uncontrollable reality that continues onward. Some credit must be given to the composition of individual segments beyond their cinematographic framing. It's easy to be swept up in their obvious, character-driven subtexts, but each review lends itself very strongly to a degree of analysis that makes it trivial to overcomplicate. I hope to tackle each act separately and tie their themes towards the film's central narrative by the end, but for now, let us see what each duo brings to the table. Although Review Starlight owes a lot to the conventions of theatre and visual cinematography in announcing its intentions, a significant amount of detail lies in its thematics, arguably the foundations of the theatrical genre it bases itself and critiques itself in. One of the anime's major selling points is how open to interpretation it is as a work of art. People decry and praise it in equal amounts, never leaving more than the bare minimum as explicit subtext for the viewer to decipher in their own way. You learn as the characters do, feel as they would, fight as they do. The theatrical setting brings the audience closer closer to the action than in any other medium, blowing the extent of what really matters to the play by its climax. Mm -hmm. 
Nana strikes me as the most important character towards this overarching idea of Revy Starlight as a critique of theatre, and as such, I will first look at her role in the wider context of the anime series. The titular Starlight is an overt representation of hopes and dreams within the acting world, and many have come to the conclusion that losing one's brilliance is a metaphor for the cruel reality of the world not working like in fiction. Looking at Rondo in retrospect, Nana's reasoning for endlessly repeating her class's rendition of the play becomes increasingly suspect. Everyone around her has yet to reach their peak, but for a deity in all but title, the satisfaction of a potential challenge is her prime motivation. Though she puts on airs of being an affable mother figure, that isolated godhood has corrupted her intentions into something far more monstrous than her original goal of keeping everyone free from moving on. The tone she displays during Geki Joban isn't pity, disgust, or even disappointment, it's indifference. When all her goodwill is pulled from underneath her feet in one sweep, it's hard not to feel something for her, seeing how badly she's been slighted. She already lost her hope by knowing of the true intention behind the auditions, so to prevent it happening again, by any means necessary, she cultivates the spirit of the tragic heroine, self-doubting, emotionally pathetic, and outwardly selfish, but still working towards the greater good with those flaws still in her heart. Much of Nana's spoken lines convey that feeling of distance that she fully embraces by Wild Screen Baroque, addressing others as if they don't exist in the same room as her. Unless directly addressed, what she says isn't always intended for the person she's engaging with. She's talking to you, the viewer, because she sees you as an equal who can understand why she takes drastic measures to regain control. To her, these new timelines were a mistake, an error that needs to be rectified for the story to return to its natural course, its survival of the fittest. As the figurative creator of this tale, it's normal for her to lash out at everyone for missing the greater meaning behind her actions. Yet in spite of such revelations, she chooses to remain terse. While we are her audience, she is the viewer for Review Starlight, a warning that a producer can lose themselves in their artistic passions if left unchecked. If Starlight is a cautionary message about the dangers of commercialising and simplifying art, then Geki Joban is the light at the end of that tunnel. Though art becomes more inaccessible, devoid of meaning, and hard to codify, there are still artists out there striving to make a change, and fighting their own battles to make their message heard. Once Nana hands her role as the viewer to Karen, her identity as the outsider to the series' paired narratives begins to revert, actively rejecting the sensation of a true defeat at the hands of those who are not meant to exist in the story. Karen and Hikari imparted their determination and humility on her, and now she must come to terms with these revelations. In philosophical terms, Nana starts out as an antithesis to Aristotle's political animal, a person with the need to form a community of like-minded individuals for their survival, i.e. the 99th class. She concerns herself with the needs of her classmates, not out of genuine interest, but because she lives outside the world everyone else is in. She can't possibly understand everyone's true feelings, because she's been so preoccupied with managing their welfare that she's never had the opportunity to stop and ask. It's an extension of the author's intent, where not everything a creator puts forward has a deep meaning behind its inclusion. It is because of this mentality that Juna, the rational and level-headed theologian, is the only one fit to break this cycle of nature that has been cultivated for so long. Like Nana, Juna puts up considerable heirs to hide her real self from people. She shares many of the self-doubting qualities that make her a fitting traditional anti-hero, but lacks many of the features that let her reach her full potential. In any other work, she'd be the perfect counter to her closest friend, but in Geki Joban, it serves to show her powerlessness. Juna doesn't know why Nana behaves the way she does in the film, nor does she have any of the advantages that allow the others to win against her in Revue Starlight, but her dogged persistence is what drives her. Her quotes are meaningless, an empty mantra to hype her up for the truth that she was merely a pawn in the grand scheme of this great play, but she understands what makes her fit for her role as the hunter. Not only is she the foil, she is the politics that grounds the 99th class, and by extension, Nana, in a world of reason. Both girls understand that Juna's self-reflectiveness make her much more powerful than Nana could ever hope to be, but they both make this awareness clear by pointing out each other's flaws. Juna is not the only sane figure of reason in an unclear world, nor is Nana a well-intentioned, godlike being who loses her sense of compassion, evolving into an unsympathetic person. They're just young adults with their own problems, coping mechanisms, and beliefs, like anyone else. The event that Juna is eventually putting an end to is her own lack of closure regarding Nana's refusal to accept her preordained role in the story. Though Juna goes to great lengths to ensure she has always been there for her friends, Nana is still incredibly obsessed with seeing to Karen's end, to the point of tunnel vision. Considering this, the context of the review of hunting is twofold. On a surface level, it forces Nana to come to terms with the damage she has caused, giving her the answer she desperately needs in order for her to stop chasing her dazzling starlight. 
Alternatively, this can also be seen as Juna's personal awakening. No longer shackled by her doubt, she comprehends the end of her childhood, taking matters into her own hands and waking her best friend from her dream-induced stupor. She has become the master, making the harsh decisions that ultimately serve the best purpose for everyone involved, while Nana exists as the beast who must either be brought into the fold and governed, or exiled from the community for its greater good. Though Nana doesn't necessarily want Juna's help, nor does she need it, Juna is the one who must make the decision, because by nature, they are both political animals, requiring each other to continue living. For anyone historically inclined, the wartime nationalist motif of the review of hunting is immediately apparent. Both Nana and Juna wear uniforms heavily modelled after Imperial Japanese Army and Navy uniforms respectively, with the intent being very clear. Juna is a traitor who dared to run from her position, and Nana is the official tasked with striking her down. The previously mentioned theme still holds true, but this adds insight into how both characters see their relationship with one another. Nana thinks she's doing the right thing, cutting off the bad tomato from its stem, while Juna seeks justice for all the wrongs committed by such an unforgiving hand. It can be seen as an added act of revenge for the earlier half of Geki Joban, where the cast is mercilessly cut down, but many of the act's core themes of acceptance are on full display here. The review of hunting ends with the two parting ways. Nana accepts that she can no longer keep her loved ones in her shadow, while Juna learns her value is much more than a defined role on the stage. Both of them acknowledge their vulnerabilities and grow into their ideal selves, which serves as their closure and ending to their story. Nevertheless, there is still a significance to the purpose of Nana as the animal in the review of hunting. The evident metaphor is that the positions have been reversed, with the long-ranged archer, Juna, on the offensive against the pragmatic and agile tiger. As the stage slowly cages Nana in, she runs out of options to engage against such attacks, reliant on her knowledge and power to escape. The cage is not only representative of the need for her to take accountability, but also speaks to the audience as one final criticism of modern art. We ask for more visually engaging animation, intellectual stimulating media or more intense choreography, and as a result we trap ourselves in complacency, constantly believing that good fiction can be, or should be, better. Nana has trapped herself in this cage too, but is now the one required to engage with the audition for the sake of our entertainment. She fights like a wild animal to break free of the constraints that shackle her as a fictional character from this unending nightmare that we've subjected the cast to. The wild screen becomes an avenue to unleash that beastly dissatisfaction, and the Baroque is the senseless carnage and inhibition that fuels our understanding of fictional mediums in the modern day. I'll confess, I didn't really understand the significance during the review of competition at first, aside from the very evident, Mahiru is very very scary when she's serious. The film does a very good job of lowering your guard at moments where important revelations are dialed in, and the frightening 180 of an affable character's emotional shift helps capture that fear of betrayal. Mahiru is often viewed as someone very heavily fixated on Karen's existence as crucial to her own development, but the theme of running away from someone else's stage places her at the forefront of her own desire to change. As the others attempt to escape the status as Quo Nana has established by finding answers in each other, Mahiru instead seeks to repair some of the damage that she has caused Hikari to endure, by ironically setting her back on the path that she should stray from. A deliberate sense of deja vu is invoked by director Furukawa with the baseball setting, as the familial visuals create the impression we've seen this song and dance before. However, the gradual progression towards a disturbing atmosphere enforces a change of the rules. If Hikari isn't playing fair anymore, Mahiru shouldn't have to adhere to those standards either. In many respects, this mirrors the feeling of competition the main cast is overwhelmed by, as they feel somewhat resentful of being constrained by the format of the TV series' reviews. The wild screen gives them an opportunity to cut loose from their shackles, to expose their greatest vulnerabilities, so that they find the answer in life that lets them move on to that next stage. As director Furukawa notes, because the audience knows that Mahiru had hated Hikari for a while, they will think, she's really going all out here. But as you all know now, it was just an act by Mahiru. She bears her heart and soul out in this performance, but the end result is neither pretty nor endearing. Rather, we get a value valuable reminder never to anger the nicest people. Hell hath no fury like one undermined, that's for sure. The framing of Mahiru and Hikari as rivals throughout this review of competition appears very fitting when seen through a symbiotic lens. Both of them require Karen as their other half to complete themselves, but you obviously can't divide nine into a whole number. Something has to budge, and when one thinks less of themselves in a particular role, they're left with nothing to lose if they absolutely must fight for their position. Mahiru breaks the rules here out of sheer desperation, going so far as to chase 
replace her rival after the game has been won. What's the point in stopping if nothing will change? Why should she stop? She says it's an act, but it's hard to believe one can act out that level of anger without some degree of truth behind it. As if art reflects life, much of Mahiru's emotion during this act comes from an encounter Furukawa had prior to outlining the film. In an encounter with one of the cast members, he recalls a story about them preparing for a stage show, but felt a disconnect between her own motivation and the enthusiasm for the audience. This is routinely echoed in Mahiru's call of acting your lines properly. Is there a point to performance if you don't take it seriously? This is echoed in the review of competition's mise-en-scene, eventually bordering on the realm of 4 4 surrealism. When things take a darker turn, the scene changes become increasingly true to life, possibly a reflection of Mahiru's attempt to act her part. We first see the prop loading area, a brisk pan over the floor layout, then the dressing room. A series of quick cuts follow each scene change, becoming more sudden as Mahiru relentlessly backs Hikari into a corner. With every close shot of the latter, the space slowly narrows down, until the audience can only eventually see Hikari's eyes abject terror a mirror of what Mahiru must be feeling at this very moment. The elevator exceeds its intended limit of three floors to reach the scaffolding, perhaps an abstract depiction of sheer anger reaching its boiling point, and then it all comes back down. On one level, this is just how competitions go. We start slowly, then escalate until a climax, and then return to zero once a result has been decided. Conversely, this can also be seen as a representation of Hikari trying to break free from the review format, as she unwittingly heads behind the scenes in an attempt to escape and find Karen. It becomes an uncomfortable form of literal escapism as the cast tackles their own struggles just as much as the audience in this scene. Fittingly, this once again ties back to the idea of political animals and the need for established laws. To Nana, and now Mahiru, Hikari is undefined, someone completely outside the framework of the pre-existing 99th class. While Nana is the god in this case, someone who possesses capabilities different from the rest of the class, Hikari is the metaphorical beast who hunts for a raison d'etre outside of the Seisho state. With this in mind, Mahiru's anger is somewhat valid, as that feeling of isolation can cause significant friction and chaos between people in the long run. Despite this, one could argue that the emotion on display is actually fear rather than fury. Mahiru Seiyu, Haruki Iwata, felt that the film overlapped with her own experiences during performances, which is something incorporated to full effect throughout the film. Though stage nerves never truly disappear, actors can adapt that into their own works when manifesting their real passions for an audience. Although Mahiru is scared of the future like everyone else, it manifests manifests in an unwavering ambition to keep moving forward. She loses Karen and Hikari, both destined for their own path in life, but she continues to exist on her own stage. The dynamic between Maya and Claudine in Revue Starlight is complicated. Both see each other as necessary for themselves to be complete, but there's an obvious sense of competition between them. To the other characters, they exist as the ceiling or goal to reach their maximum potential, the top star being a symbol of the glory yet to be achieved in your prime years. Maya and Claudine have devoted their entire being to theatre, constantly in pursuit of this high, but in the end, it means nothing without another person to compare themselves to. Maya particularly suffers from the effects of her lifelong endeavour. Her life has become one with theatre, the two of them intrinsically fused into one being. There cannot be Tendo Maya without the performing arts, and the performing arts means nothing without the dominating influence of Tendo Maya. The review of Pride in the TV show perfectly demonstrates her weakness, acknowledging that there is nothing for someone of her character except the absolute pinnacle of stardom. If one simply takes this at face value, Maya is the perfect example of a one-trick genius, devoting her whole being to a practice notorious for chewing and grinding up everyone it catches. Showing weakness, even for one moment, would mean the defeat of her entire personality, knowing that her work was all for naught. Despite her imposing presence on and off the stage, she is arguably the character with the least focus in Geki Joban. Her presence is often dedicated to being the overinformed butt of the joke, and despite putting up a good show at the end of the review of Annihilation, no amount of power or experience can compensate for someone like Nana, always one step ahead in thinking outside of the box. Her strength is a facade for others to compare their progression, but they see her as a challenge to overcome, not as a competitor to see on the same level. Of course, many of these statements will be obvious to anyone who's seen the TV show. By the end of the review of Fate, where Maya and Claudine finally open up to each other, it's clear that no amount of training or preparation can deal with someone determined enough to break through that barrier and forge a path for themselves. Maya gets little dedicated attention in Revue Starlight, because in a fictional context, she has already reached her finale. Someone of her level was always destined for success, and the only logical conclusion from that point onwards is to give her humility, to make her a person rather than a character. Her incomplete motivation makes sense when compared to the other character arcs, as Claudine is the final piece that completes her personal conundrum, and with the final
final boss out of the picture, there is little need for Maya to be there. She serves her purpose to motivate the others, and when they are ready to deal with their respective developments, she is no longer needed. But what of Claudine? Why is she the one needed to complete Maya's own brilliance and give her meaning? For her, Maya is the only one she can never beat, the one that got away. There will always be someone better, more worthy of the title of top star than her, and that motivation to surpass one's own limits makes Claudine a worthy deuteragonist in the performance of Starlight. By any other measure, she can be seen as the traditional Greek hero, a figure with few flaws, on good terms with everyone, and highly skilled. She exhibits few real flaws at first glance, while also appearing to be a relatable character. However, the need to exceed these boundaries leaves Claudine incomplete, and this fuel to become even better is a total dichotomy to Maya, who only knows what it's like to be at the top. Not only do the pair complete each other, they complement each other far more than they care to admit. Like Gilgamesh and Ankidu, or Macbeth and Bonquo, Maya and Claudine display their true selves in tandem when together, painfully and finished by themselves. Again, these qualities are explicitly displayed in both the show and film. A careful consideration is taken to highlight that these two are in a league of their own, with their conflict running perpendicular to the main storyline rather than alongside it. So what makes them important to the overall progression of Revue Starlight and Geki Joban? Like Nana and Karen, they're the protagonists of their own self-contained play. If Karen is the face of this series and its primary focus, and Nana the fallen hero who succumbs to her newfound power, then Maya and Claudine stress the traditional influences of theatre above all, playing to their mythological strengths as the anti-hero and prototypical main lead respectively. The review of Souls is a poignant inversion to the message that words don't reach without action, as acting to the highest standards waters down the true self and distorts intention, the foundations of method acting. Maya feels no need to prove herself on the stage, but still accepts Claudine's challenge, because it's the right option. Why would someone as talented as her need to refuse such a dangerous game? In this instance, the stage becomes the battleground, and to appease the audience, she forces herself to become the tyrannical ruler, unwavering in her authority. The format behind the Review of Souls is not just an attempt to enforce order in a now disjointed world. Compared to the modernised environments of the previous auditions, adhering to classical theming seems outdated and contrary to the nature of Wild Screen Baroque. In spite of this, the historical foundations perfectly represent the natures of the actors on that stage. Maya and Claudine were born to act, in contrast to the other members of the 99th class, who instead engaged with the medium in their formative years. Theatre is their lifeblood, their own history History, just as they contribute their performances to the legacy of theatre. This is enforced in the audition being segmented into four acts. Following in the layout of traditional theatre, the pair carve their own tale into parts, narrating their origins, rise, and climactic downfall in a format heavily inspired by Shakespeare. Hammering down this idea is the historical events that the Revue of Souls is comprised of. The first act starts with a dramatic interpretation of Goethe's Faust, before transitioning to a compilation of well-known theatrical backgrounds drops, first with La Grande Armée and the Battle of Waterloo, then the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and finally Antony and Cleopatra. No matter the role, no matter the play, no matter the stage, Maya is the one in charge, the woman who shapes history. Maya wagering her soul is symbolic of her inability to see past her future and social. She pays the cost of her short-sightedness, believing herself to be above the need for rules and customs, but still playing by the conditions of the game that Claudine subjects her to. Concepts like a soul and art are intangible, lacking any sort of physical form for the demon to take as payment. What does a ruler have to fear when there's nothing to lose? Provocation is Maya's goal, as there is little doubt in her victory when relying solely on her own strengths. When Claudine backs the stage figure into a corner and mistakenly thinks she has fulfilled her end of the bargain, it shows the futility of comparing yourself to someone indifferent. Like Nana, Maya doesn't speak to her rival, instead talking at her, as if to convince herself that she doesn't need Claudine for success. This confidence is, once again, a ruse, as you can't kill a supernatural entity. Although the demon doesn't get what they want, neither does the stage figure, as they both lack something to make them truly powerful. But why do they need these qualities to give them a purpose? To answer this question, and to hopefully confirm the importance of Maya and Claudine's dynamic as a unit, I once again turn to Aristotle's politics. He states that the people best suited to leadership roles are those who know what it is like to be ruled, and to rule over others in turn. By these definitions, Maya is the tyrant, the ruler who rules for her own benefit rather than that of the people, i.e. her classmates, whereas Claudine is the democrat, placing everyone first with little consideration for her own ego. 
The former rules with little experience as the subject, while the latter has placed herself as one with those she could easily subjugate. The soul is the self-confidence needed to triumph over great adversity, and the brilliance is the feeling of humility born from a crushing defeat. The pair wager two items of inherently disproportionate value, but the result of that exchange ultimately makes both of them equal. By discarding the facades used to mask their emotions, Maya and Claudine fight each other with an intensity far above their typical rivalry, cementing their relationship as meaningless without one another for support. For heroes, there are trials. For saints, there are temptations. For the ruler, there are subjects. And for Maya, there is Claudine. The Big O, using the tomato as symbolism for the false self, showcased the limitations of living life dishonestly. Every character in the show lacked knowledge of a valuable truth, and to accept they had lied to themselves, they first had to admit that who they once were was someone completely different from the person that they are now. The final moments of civilization were documented in an eternally unfinished scripture, while the remnants of humanity closed themselves off from the outside world in Paradigm City, blissfully grown and ripened to harvest the last fragments of life's memories as fuel for society's complete destruction. Although the comparison to Geki Joban might seem very far-fetched, the meaning of the tomato carries the same resonance. Those who consume it become enlightened, now consciously aware of their existence as fuel for someone else's entertainment. The giraffe being unable to maintain physical form during the second half of the film represents this reality starting to break down as the series reaches its conclusion. His abstract metamorphosis into a semi-literal fruit bowl shows him losing the little influence he has left on the story, as Nana's meddling has superseded any authority over current events. At that point, his becoming the fuel for the performances is Pyrrhic, as he permits his consumption by the cast for their best possible endings. Within the context of Revue Starlight, he may be considered a stand-in for the audience's desire to see more violent and passionate acts, endangering the girls for the sake of wilder fights, or perhaps a critique on the brutal nature of the Takarazuka Revue and its uncomfortably harsh practices. My lack of knowledge on the latter prevents me from analysing the extent of how far this theory runs true, but with the revelations of the post covid with landscape on anime production in 2021, Geki Joban couldn't hit any further as a lambasting of studios like UFO Table and Mappa, crunching unfathomable hours to produce yet another headliner that breaks box office records. The actors hunger for more opportunities to showcase themselves, and the viewers continue raising their expectations higher and higher, until they grow tired of the stagnant material they're provided with. By the end of Wild Screen Baroque, everyone realises that they're merely fictional actors, playing the part of someone that never really existed to begin with. The goal of becoming the top star was a ruse meant to lure them in, and the brilliance they lost was a sign that they had to sacrifice something for personal growth. When Kaoruko bursts into outrage at having to move on from the auditions, she becomes an adrenaline junkie with nothing of meaning left in her life, little more than a vehicle for that fever to run amok. Having already once lost her brilliance to Starlight, Hikari is more than aware of what happens when defeated in the auditions, but she continues to escape from the truth, fleeing with the knowledge that she has damned Karen to that same fate. Eating the tomato gives the 99th class the clarity to understand the stakes at hand, moving them onto the next stage of their life. But what about Karen, or Hikari, or Nana? Geki Joban has given them omniscience to comprehend their meaning as something far greater than a simple stage girl, but they don't necessarily consume the tomato willingly. Nana becomes the greater scope for this final loose end to repair itself, and merely obtains personal wisdom for the sake of resolving her own conflict with Juna. Hikari takes great pains in her participation, but eventually understands that she must play along for what must be done. Karen lives with the discomforting truth that she has been in the shadows throughout her entire acting career. Putting on a brave face, she insists on showing others that they can perform Starlight with her, ignorant to the tape that has been running on repeat right beside her. She can only understand Nana's words by the end of the film, because the two of them have reached the same conclusion. Unable to compete with the others in the class, they endlessly stunted their growth and refinement, ceaselessly hoping for a miracle in which their escapism would bear fruit and keep everyone together. 
The death of her body is the final step needed to accept that her selfishness was wrong, as her reality is shattered open, and the tomato that acts as her hold on this fake world splits apart. Once again, she is remade, this time in her true image, rather than the ideal Karen that she wants others to see. Another train becomes representative of her own self-reflection, as she comes to terms with herself and moves away from the selves she kept storing away. In essence, she kills the past and moves into the future, the present day that was so elusive to her. Karen is remade one final time, having reached the end of her development, and finally accepting that she didn't need to compete with Hikari to enjoy a future in acting. The final few minutes of Geki Joban wrap up the open-ended conclusion of the TV show with its own interpretation of the ending. Hikari wins the review and ultimately regains the brilliance she lost, but this too can be seen as a pyrrhic victory. Karen comes out of the auditions much stronger and determined in life than she ever was, and it can be argued that she progresses past the need for Hikari to motivate her future in theatre. Starlight is complete, and the cycle that Nana lost control over is broken by Karen's intervention. The Revy Starlight film completes the overarching storyline that the TV series and Rondo left up to interpretation. Although the ending betrays the expectation that nobody won during the review of Astral Sins, it serves as a fitting end for us as the audience, forming our own closure through seeing the girls achieve theirs. Moving on is always difficult, but if you enjoyed the time you spent making those memories, then it was not a waste of time. Geki Joban fills the void that many cinematic revisions or sequels aim to satisfy, showing an optimistic side to the chaos and tragedy that goes on behind the scenes of life. Unlike Episode Final or End of Evangelion, where the Aesop is that humanity will continue to destitute itself forever, irrespective of the actions of the good people, this film believes in the potential of people to do good to be better, and to respect one another as individuals with their own aspirations. That leaves the question of whether Revue Starlight as a whole is a critique on the state of modern art, or a contemporary statement on future optimism. There's an argument to be made either way. A lot of the thematic, visual, and narrative elements that make up the bulk of Geki Joban will be obtuse to the first time viewer, if not obscured or entirely withheld from them. Personally, I feel that's what makes it the best possible end to the story. Just as Seisho Academy's 99th class didn't know everything about what was going on, the audience doesn't exactly need to know everything either. We all live life with something missing from our knowledge of how the world around us works, but it doesn't detract from the fact that we can still live a life that satisfies us. There doesn't need to be a winner, nor do we need to devote every single waking moment to that we hold dearest, but the Aesop that matters most is that we are alive. Karen is remade, enacting in her own starlight somewhere in the world, and that brilliance is what motivates us to seek our own fitting endings. Enji, kitchatta. Debut, starlight.